call the good, the bad, and the ugly. And that is major treatment innovations, high-risk myeloma in terms of the bad, uh, ugly being clinical trial participation and drug costs. And then I'd like to introduce you to some of the people involved in our UW myeloma effort. So well, multiple myeloma, the question has come up about how long multiple myeloma has been around. And in the first panel here, this is a CT scan of a mummy. Now, you could use your imagination as these people did and say, you know, that looks like maybe a compression fracture or a lesion. You know, maybe you're not this mummy head myeloma. We don't know. Uh, this is probably more convincing. This is a fossil from 3000 BC from Spain. And it sure looks like this person probably had lytic bone disease. And the reason that this is even a question at all is because really the first case in the Western literature involves this poor woman, Sarah Newbery, who was 39 when she presented to a dispensary in London with uh, terrible fractures of her bones, uh, very, very unfit. But this had been going on for a number of years by the time she came in. She did not survive very long. And at autopsy, her bones were very brittle. They could crack them with their hands. And inside, there was this gelatinous material. And across town, at roughly the same time, this gentleman was taking care of another patient called Thomas McBean. And this is uh, Lord Henry Bentz Jones. And Mr. McBean also had some of the same problems that Ms. Newberry did. But when he had noticed when he was urinating that there was this sort of weird junk that would precipitate later on. And Henry Bentz Jones is the person who started analyzing this stuff that he ended up deciding was, in fact, a protein and published his observations back in 1847. And so these are really considered sort of the index cases of myeloma. Now, in terms of epidemiology, myeloma is the 14th most common type of cancer in the US. It accounts for about 2% of all cancers. And it is the second most common type of blood cancer. There's going to be about 30,000 new cases this year diagnosed in the US. Now, one of the very interesting fe features about multiple myeloma is children do not get this disease. There's a case report of a 14-year-old, a case report of an 18-year-old, but in general, this is a disease of older people, and we really don't understand why the average age is in their 60s when people are diagnosed, and fewer than 1% of patients are under age 35. One of the other interesting features about multiple myeloma is that on the panel on the right, there are ethnic differences that we see both in the US and around the world in terms of incidence of myeloma. So many of you know probably that that the incidence of myeloma is twice as high in African Americans. That's also been seen in men in Ghana, in Africa. There, uh, there are more men than women with myeloma. And Hispanic uh, patients down here are somewhere in between. It's very unusual to see myeloma in Asian patients and also in Native Americans. Um, one of the other things that we are looking at is, as opposed to many, many cancers, we think that the uh, incidence of myeloma is actually increasing. And it seems to be more so than just explained by the aging of the population. Now, risk factors for the development of myeloma. As many of you may know, in 1991, the Institutes of Medicine released a report uh, associating a certain medical conditions with Agent Orange exposure, and myeloma ended up being one of those. Also implicated is exposure to benzene, radiation. There is increased incidence of myeloma in farmers, wood, and leather manufacturers. But myeloma doesn't appear to be much of an inherited risk for patients. And uh, a study was done in Sweden and later in the US looking at first degree relatives of patients who have what's called monoclonal gammopathy that we'll talk about later. And there was a, a modest increase in risk about three times over the general population, not just in myeloma, but in Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia and chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Now, for those families that do appear to have a uh, clustering of cases, there's been some gene sequencing done, but there really hasn't been one specific marker that you can look at, either for uh, screening or diagnosis. There is some interest in an, area, uh, in an enzyme called Paratarg7, but at this point, we do not have a spe specific polymorphism that we can look at to say, aha, this is going to drastically increase your risk of myeloma. Now, symptoms. Uh, many of you are very familiar with this. There's a sort of a triad. But typically, what we tend to see are three big things. Fatigue is one. Anemia, which occurs in about 75% of patients. And some sort of bone complaint. And that can be pain, fractures, uh, premature osteoporosis. And that occurs in about 90% of patients. Uh, there's an increased risk of infection, as shown here with a patient with uh, right lower lobe pneumonia. The, uh, uh, pain, as I mentioned. 
And um, unfortunately, about 20% of patients come in with some sort of renal complaint, and some of these patients end up on dialysis right off the bat. There are also symptoms that can be associated with hypercalcemia in about 10% of patients. Now, what is really going wrong in myeloma? Still very unclear, and this is basically showing you a cartoon of B-cell development. Much of this takes place in germinal centers. And some people have said at the step where there is VDJ recombination that there may be an acquisition of a mutation uh, that ultimately leads to an aberrant plasma cell instead of the normal one shown here, so that we believe that there's a model now of a continuum where uh, plasma cells, again, are developing an index mutation back here. They go through a progression where they accumulate more and more mutations, and then ultimately the patient has myeloma. Now, more interestingly, uh, and more recently, is we believe that this is not happening in a vacuum, but there are all sorts of players in here that are maybe facilitating myeloma, but all, or maybe even, in fact, causing them to go bad, and that is uh, components like natural killer cells, stromal cells, osteoclasts, Treg cells, and actually maybe elements in the extracellular matrix as well, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Now, uh, the hallmark of multiple myeloma, as everybody is probably familiar with, is the production of a monoclonal protein. And just basically up here, you, this is essentially to represent the normal repertoire of uh, immunoglobulin production by many various plasma cells. One thing that happens in myeloma is, of course, they, they elaborate a monoclonal protein, sometimes an intact immunoglobulin molecule, sometimes light chains. And, in, and also along with this, you tend to see a diminution of the normal immunoglobulin classes. Now again, another feature of myeloma that's not understood, the types of monoclonal proteins that patients make in general recapitulates what you see in terms of the normal antibody class distribution, but only to a certain degree. So for example, about 60% of patients with myeloma will make an IgG antibody, about 20% will make IgA, but my uh, true IgM-producing myeloma is almost non-existent. It's very, very rare, and we don't really know why. About 20% of patients make light chain myeloma, and then there's a few in here that make two types. That's unusual. And then there are some patients whose myeloma cells don't elaborate any protein at all. So I'm going to just uh, show you. I'm not going to go through all of these steps. We have a very uh, elaborate diagnostic work up here. This is the National Comprehensive Cancer Net Network Guidelines, and this is their website down here if you'd like to look into this. Uh, there is a whole list here, and I'm just going to tell you some of the highlights of this. So this is a, a picture probably familiar to all the med students in the audience. This is a patient who has Rouleau formation, which occurs because of coating of red cells with antibodies that, dis uh, that uh, inhibit some of the electrostatic uh, charges. And of course, this is a serum protein electrophoresis. Uh, you may be interested to know this technology was developed about 1948, and the first serum protein electrophoresis machine occupied an entire gym, and the sample took one week to come back. So we're, we're doing better than that now, although it still seems like it takes a little bit of time. But um, anyways, what you're looking for, again, is in about 80% of patients seeing this monoclonal protein spike when you run serum across a gradient, a couple of things to note, though, is that, again, about 20% of patients with light chain myeloma may not have this kind of pattern. Patients with IgA myeloma, sometimes that spike just hides here a little bit in the beta region and, and can be difficult for people to quantitate. But it's still a, a valuable tool. You can do a urine protein electrophoresis, and this is just showing you a large spike in the urine where normally there's no protein. But this is sometimes very cumbersome for patients, and the sensitivity of this test varies often from lab to lab. So one of the major innovations in testing occurred about 15 years ago with the development of what's called the free light chain assay that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. This is based on the observation that um, outside of an intact immunoglobulin, there are small numbers of free light chains in circulation, and these are the normal ranges. And it turns out that we can use this test to both diagnose myeloma as well as some other disorders and follow how patients are doing. And again, this is a test run in serum. So let's look at lytic bone disease. Uh, this is something that a bone survey can pick up, and these are examples of skull lesions, uh, compression fractures. This is a patient who went on to have a pathologic fracture right through that lesion. And interestingly, those lesions are happening when this occurs inside the bone marrow. So these are plasma cells, malignant plasma cells, 
And right next to them are osteoclasts clustered around bone. And we really think that this is the sequence that the myeloma cells are turning on the osteoclast to chew up this bone and cause these, this kind of destruction. Now, why that really happens and why myeloma hones directly to the bone marrow environment is still not known. You can get extra medullary deposits of multiple myeloma. This is a person, a patient of mine who had a liver deposit. This is actually a, a patient uh, who had a prostatic uh, involvement with myeloma. Um, you, MRIs have become increasingly important for diagnosis and staging. This is a patient, whoop, this is a patient uh, who had a uh, replacement of T5 here with a plasma cytoma causing cord compression, and you can see other lesions here. You can also use an MRI more and more to say a person doesn't have myeloma. For example, if you think that they really just have MGUS, uh, for example, which we'll talk about in a minute. PET scans are increasingly looked at in myeloma, although the role for these t uh, studies is not sure, clearly defined yet. This, again, is a patient showing you multiple areas of uptake, and in this case, not just in bones, but actually in the person's liver. Not every patient with myeloma has an informative PET scan. In other words, they don't all take up or, or show this kind of metabolic activity. You can use a PET scan for those small number of patients who have non-secretory myeloma or to confirm that somebody only has a plasma cytoma. And there's increasing interest in using PET scan results, particularly at the end of a treatment, which is illustrated here after transplant, to use it as more of a prognostic tool. But this is still really investigational. Now, in terms of some newer technology that's coming around, this is what's called a whole body low-dose CT, and it is infinitely superior to, to a bone survey and picking up lesions, which you can clearly see in this case. Um, one of the things that's hampering the, more, the distribution is actually some billing issues about how to charge for this, which is unfortunate. Um, in, in more very uh, m uh, interesting technology that we're looking at here at UW with Steve Cho here from radiology is using what's called PET-MR. And this gives you the same sort of increased metabolic, <coughs> excuse me, uptake that you could see in the bone lesions here, but the precision and the, and, uh, the clarity of these images is far superior. So this is something that we're uh, uh, developing a clinical protocol for. Now, the hallmark to say you have myeloma is you have to show some plasma cells, typically in the bone marrow. And then on the right, you have to show that they are clonal. So this is, these are stains here for... CD138, and this is showing that this particular myeloma stains for kappa and not lambda. And then what we do now with bone marrows is do, on the left here, cytogenetic interrogation and fish. Now, for many, many years, myeloma never had cytogenetic testing done. And that's because, to make this very pretty picture here, you have to have a cell that's actively dividing. So you can tease out the chromosomes and then photograph them and look at translocations, look at different missing pieces. So myeloma doesn't grow that fast in reality in most cases. So that's why the development of fish technology, fluorescence in situ hybridization, was so important, because you can test cells that are not dividing, and you can even go back and test old samples to look at this. And, and basically, the technology involves adding various fluorescent probes here, and you can easily show in non-dividing cells whether a chromosome is missing or if it is recombined. So this technology has been in about wide use for about 10 years. And what we now know is that we can, based on certain fish patterns and cytogenetic patterns, separate out patients prognostically in terms of how they're going to do. And we now refer to two groups of patients. Up here we call standard risk people. That's about around... Uh, uh, 85 to 90 percent of patients, depending on who's publishing this. And then we talk about people who have high-risk multiple myeloma, who have some of these uh, changes in cytogenetics or uh, as interrogated by fish. Unfortunately, it looks like patients with high-risk myeloma, un despite major advances, still have a much poorer survival overall, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So now we speak of what are called myeloma-defining events to say somebody has this disease, so some of these are very familiar, that you have to show that they have a monoclonal uh, uh, plasma cells, they have a, a, a monoclonal protein. And, and then I, we used to speak of just CRAB. Uh, patients would have a symptom like hypercalcemia, renal disease, anemia, or bone disease. But the latest revision adds just uh, some lab findings, including more than 60% plasma cells in a marrow, or a high free light chain ratio, or a focal, more than one focal lesion on MRI. Not so much a lytic lesion, but like a deposit of myeloma. All right, so we also stage this disease. I'll just very quickly mention this. Uh, we split it up based on 
to lab tests, uh, three lab tests, albumin, beta-2 microglobulin, and LDH, and then we now factor in those cytogenetics to show uh, staging here, one, two, three. Just one thing to remember is one, two, three is treated the same. Um, now, many, many patients ask us by the time they're diagnosed, why did it take so long for somebody to figure out that we had myeloma? And one of the things has to do with just what patients have as symptoms. And so many, many patients that we see have back pain, and there are 3.2 million visits per year to the ER for patients with back pain. And then if you look at people in whose back pain does not resolve, it's more than a third of patients. So that, again, you know, you wouldn't expect necessarily or you wouldn't want a person coming into the ER to say, okay, we're going to evaluate you for myeloma, certainly on your first visit. And then the other issue is that we don't really have good screening tests. So why is that? And that has to do with this entity that I'm sure many people are familiar with called monoclonal of uh, unknown significance. And it turns out a large number of normal people just have a monoclonal protein sitting around. And it is 3% of 50-year-olds. It is 10% of 80-year-olds who have this. They don't have a, a very high protein levels, and they don't have a lot of plasma cells in their bone marrow, and they don't have any symptoms from this at all. And uh, we don't really know why this uh, happens, but what we do know is that most of these patients, if you follow them, and this is a longitudinal study from Mayo, if you follow them 25 years, only about a quarter of the patients will ever have progression to something. And it's not always myeloma either. This is hematologic neoplasms, so the most of it is myeloma, but it can also be CLL or Waldenstrom's or amyloidosis. But that means 75% of patients, even if they have an increase in protein down here, they won't get myeloma. So we don't think sending a serum protein electrophoresis is a good idea in the absence of symptoms. Now, we can help in terms of trying to define, is a patient more likely or not when they have MGUS to develop myeloma? And you can look at three things, and that is how much monoclonal protein they have, if it is over 1.5 grams, is it anything uh, other than IgG? Because if it is, that's a bad thing. And also, do they have an uh, altered free light chain ratio? So if you have all three of those things, then your chances of developing myeloma in 10 years is about 40%. Now, do, we do think that you should see these people with monoclonal gammopathy regularly, about every six months to a year, because SEER data suggests that that helps prevent morbidity down the road. And actually, it's been shown to prevent renal failure as well as death. All right. Now, patients sometimes ask, what could I do if I have MGUS to keep myself from having myeloma? And there is very good information that obesity is linked to the progression of myeloma from MGUS. And so this, these are uh, uh, retrospective studies. Uh, put together by Ken Carson at uh, WashU, and he is in the process of, of proving the principle here that we think because obesity seems to increase inflammation that we might be able to come up with an intervention of diet and exercise that will help prevent people from progressing to myeloma. And of course, this is something that we could ask patients to do. There is a little entity called smoldering myeloma that I won't talk about too much. These patients have a little bit more plasma cells, and their risk of progression to myeloma is a lot higher, about 10% of year for year. The reason that this is, whoops, the reason, the reason this is of interest is that uh, we are hoping that uh, some er intervention in this high-risk group may actually alter the, the natural history and perhaps prevent them from ever getting myeloma at all. And so there's some trials underway for this. Okay, so now we're going to go to the good. All right, there are really are very few cancers that you can look at that have tripled survival in 15 years, but that's what we've done in myeloma. So I want to bring you back to poor Sarah Newbery here. When she was diagnosed, this was her treatment, Orange Peel Porter, a mutton shop, and suffice it to say, she lived five days. It didn't work very well. And her, her compatriot, Mr. McBean, got bleeding and, and uh, cupping. Uh, and that also didn't, wasn't particularly effective. And so we went through a period of time when there was really not much we could do for myeloma. Uh, steel shavings was recommended, uh, sassafras, uh, rhubarb. And this is a very interesting paper from our medical school library from 1947 showing urethane. The chemical urethane was administered to patients for myeloma and uh, leukemia. So I think something that we would be a little bit loath to do today. So we did have radiation, and for a while that was one of the only treatments that we had, and we used to radiate either the top half or the bottom half. That was one of the ways to treat myeloma. But survival really from the 1840s up to really the mid-1950s was about six months for patients. 
So one of the major innovations came with the development of this drug, melphalan, L-phenylalanine mustard, uh, and uh, it was synthesized both uh, simultaneously in the Soviet Union. This guy won the Soviet Union uh, award, that's Dr. Blokin, and then a group in London, Virgil and Stock, also developed this simultaneously. And the introduction of melphalan actually was very uh, revolutionary, and it increased survival from about six months to about two years. This was also shown with, whoops, with cyclophosphamide, and uh, steroids tend to make these drugs work better. So that was in 1960. So 20 years later, here is a page from a textbook here again in our library showing you what to treat myeloma with, and you basically have gotten no place in 25 years. It's melphalan, it's cyclophosphamide, it's steroids, and not much is going on. So things were looking pretty grim. So one of the reasons that the other advances that were happening in leukemia treatment at this time weren't happening in myeloma may have something to do with the cell cycle in myeloma. And many chemotherapy drugs that we commonly use to treat lymphoma and leukemia only work during DNA replication or S phase. And these drugs um, seem to be very uh, uh, unhelpful in myeloma. And that is because it looks like myeloma cells in general spend very little time in S phase, and so those drugs would not be particularly helpful. So what happened? Well, sort of serendipity happened. And this is the thalidomide story. So as you may or may not know, in 1957, thalidomide was synthesized by a German company, and it was re actually released without prescription. It was over the counter. It was released in 40 countries around the world and Canada and uh, led to phycomelia, these uh, very terrible birth defects in kids. In the U.S., only about 20,000 women received uh, thalidomide at all, and it actually has to do with this physician, Frances Kelsey. And she is single-handedly responsible for blocking thalidomide coming into this country because she demanded that there was no clinical trial evidence of safety, and she refused to allow this drug to be uh, officially authorized and this is for receiving uh, a Distinguished Medal of Honor from JFK for this work. So thalidomide was banned, and it's sort of sitting there until this gentleman, Dr. Jacob Sheskin, in Israel, was treating patients with leprosy. And there's a form of leprosy called erythema nodosum leprosum, very painful, causes lots of um, uh, uh, night sweats, other symptoms. He was looking for something to soothe pain and maybe help them sleep a little bit, and he took a bottle of thalidomide off the shelf, treated a patient, unbelievable results within a matter of days. And he was really credited as being the first person to sort of resuscitate thalidomide as potentially having significant therapeutic value. Um, the, the, the application, though, of this drug in myeloma is also credited to this gentleman, Judah Folkman, a surgeon uh, working in Boston who was really the father of the anti-angiogenesis movement in cancer treatment. And he is uh, suggested to a researcher at the University of Arkansas to use thalidomide and myeloma. This was in 1997, and lo and behold, it led to this trial, a publication in the New England Journal of Medicine, two years later, showing in relapsed patients with myeloma amazing responses to thalidomide. Uh, unbelievable news. So this compound thalidomide was uh, bought by Celgene, a company here in the U.S., and two analogs were, were developed around 2000, lenalidomide or revlimid and pomalidomide or pomalis, both developed simultaneously. And these drugs, which we now call imid drugs, are really one of the mainstays of myeloma therapy and have really changed the lives of patients for the better. Now, in sort of a different thread, uh, proteasomes were discovered around the 1970s and 1980s as sort of the garbage can of cells. This was actually work funded by the, uh, by the federal government in, uh, simultaneously in several laboratories, uh, including an, a researcher, Marian Orlowski, found out that these, uh, these uh, uh, complexes existed and then thought that maybe blockade of these complexes might be helpful in cancer treatment. Uh, PS331 was synthesized uh, at a sort of startup company in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and it turns out Dr. Orlowski's son, Robert Orlowski, who is now the uh, chief of myeloma at MD Anderson, was actually one of the first people who got their hands on this drug, ran a clinical trial in multiple cancer types uh, in 1999, but again showed amazing results in patients with relapsed myeloma, and this led to essentially the drug that we now know as, know as bortezomib. So these two drugs have been blockbusters for us. Uh, they both independently work, but as you can imagine, it didn't take very long before people said, well, let's combine these two types of drugs with the other drugs that we have, 
And uh, eventually we got to the point where we said, let's do them together, because that might be a very good strategy. So that is where we are now. So, so one question was, we have these image drugs, we have these proteasome inhibitors, maybe we could use one now and one later and save them, but this has really been a, a, a practice-changing trial comparing lenalidomide and dexamethasone, so two drugs, versus three drugs, so using our big twos and steroids. And basically what was shown just last year is that using those three drugs not just improved response, you know, that's important, but it also improved control of myeloma, and even more important, it improved survival. And that was just adding in six months of Velcade treatment along with the Revlimid. So, so we really think that, that that triplet therapy is now a mainstay of treatment and something that should be considered in everyone except the most frail of patients. What did I just do? I think I threw that. Okay. All right. So why are these drugs so good? Probably it's because they're dirty drugs. So, so although proteasome inhibitors, that's their name, they do a lot of different things. And, and the reason that they work so well together is they're hitting, we believe, multiple pathways at once. And so if one uh, pathway or one enzyme is overexpressed by tumor cells or maybe these macrophages or, or uh, stromal cells, then these drugs can interact to block another pathway. And this is really why we think they're so good. Now, we're very excited in the myeloma world, more good, because last year we had two different antibody drugs evaluate, uh, approved for myeloma. On the left here is a drug called daratumumab, which is an IgG antibody against CD38, which is expressed on plasma cells and uh, many uh, B cells. And this drug has created a lot of excitement because it can be given by itself in patients who've had many therapies, and about a third of them respond. Uh, it can be combined with drugs, and it looks very effective. And elituzumab, which is a drug aimed at a CS1, a, an antigen on myeloma cells, but also on natural killer cells. And the, this drug does not necessarily seem to be so effective by itself, but it seems to have an effect boosted by, in particular, imid drugs. And this also may actually, or, or both of them, in fact, may actually do some resetting of the immune system and we anticipate that these two drugs will be moved up to front line in a very short period of time and perhaps extend further uh, that initial phase of, of control. In, now, if that isn't enough, in the last five years, we've had six drugs approved for use in myeloma, um, and so we really have sort of an embarrassment of riches here. And again, going back to those national uh, comprehensive network recommendations, these are all considered reasonable options for frontline treatment for myeloma. Um, so how do you pick? Well, like I said, we believe that that recent study using three drugs is one that should be respected. But another decision point we make is, are we going to transplant patients or not? So there are two types of transplants that I think most of you are aware of, using your own cells or using cells coming from somebody else. And the majority of transplants done for myeloma are used with a patient's own cells. And basically what we're doing with this kind of transplant is harnessing the concept of dose intensity. And what that says is that if you have a relatively unresistant cancer, and myeloma is considered relatively resistant, if you increase the dose of drug here, you're going to increase the response rate. And this concept was proven uh, in 1983 by some researchers, Dr. McElwain and Powell's from uh, uh, the UK. They basically took nine patients with very advanced myeloma and gave them intravenous melphalan, that old drug that gave about 100 times the standard dose, and was able to show that those patients actually responded, about eight out of nine did. However, not unexpectedly, they had a lot of toxicity from that. So what a transplant does is you get to give that very high dose of melphalan, and that's still what we use, but you rescue a person from the side effects using their own bone marrow or now plasma or, or stem cells. And uh, this was really the first study showing that there was an advance giving transplants to patients. This is from 1996. And you can t see again that patients getting a transplant on top of chemo, better, better response, and actually, again, better survival, which was about four times higher at, at a five-year follow-up time. So this is one of many studies that, that went to establish transplants as really a standard of care for patients. Now, people hate transplants for obvious reasons. They're toxic. So one question that's come up with all these great new drugs, should you still consider doing a transplant? And at least for now, uh, if you're only going to use a limited amount of introductory chemotherapy once a patient is 
when they're diagnosed? The answer is yes. So this is one of the most recent studies looking at that powerful triplet, bortezomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone, only given a relatively short time and then followed by a transplant. And you can tell based on this graph here that at least, whoops, at least at this point we know that the maintaining, maintaining a response in myeloma is much better if you use a transplant. But what we don't know yet is survival. And that actually is a very important endpoint in all myeloma trials. So the suggestion is there that maybe we are going to continue to embrace transplants as a part of, of patient care for those who can do it. And we're waiting to see final results from this. It does also look like you can deepen the response of patient's myeloma, and that may also be a very important factor. Now, the reason transplants, you know, this data is one of the reasons why autologous stem cell transplants for myeloma is the number one reason we do transplants in the U.S. It accounts for essentially 52% of all transplants done in the U.S., and this is basically mirrored around the world. All right, maintenance therapy, another good thing for patients. And so some studies have been done uh, in the last 20 years looking at, at addition of drugs, both lenalidomide and, and len uh, Velcade, after initial treatment from patients. This is a study that we were fortunate to participate here in, in uh, uh, Madison. Um, this is a study where patients after a stem cell transplant were given Revlimid uh, or placebo, and you can tell, again, this is almost 10-year follow-up now, that patients who got the lenalidomide not only had better control of their myeloma, but again, appeared to live longer. So one of the questions is, is that how, if we are going to give maintenance, though, is should we give it forever or not? And that's currently being addressed by some other clinical trials. So more good, coming up is all sorts of other new drugs for multiple myeloma, not to mention some types of immunotherapy, trying to turn back on a patient's immune cells. Uh, and those things look fantastic, and we're very excited to have all of these things to offer patients. So this is really the reason why we've been able to improve survival so much in the, in the past a decade and a half. But now we got to go to the bad. All right, so there's two things I want to focus on here. And one is what, again, those high-risk myeloma patients. And these patients, um, these patients, unfortunately, continue to have worse survival than everybody else. And uh, one of the issues is, is that sort of regardless of what we do, this is looking at a, a various therapies here, and these are patients with high risk versus standard risk. Regardless of what we're doing right now, these patients continue to do worse. And that means chemo, that means transplants. And so we really have to look for a better strategy. So there's two that have been, uh, one has been completed, one is being considered. This is a trial we participated adding in one of those antibody drugs, elituzumab, to that great backbone, Revlimid, Velcade, and Dexamethasone. And we're trying to see whether that makes a difference for newly diagnosed high-risk patients. The, the results of this are going to come out this summer. And the other is a trial that's being led here by Dr. Eric Hall. And what this is going to do is actually offer patients an opportunity, if they have high-risk myeloma, to consider an allogeneic stem cell transplant to try to control their disease better. So this trial is ongoing. Now, the other bad thing is, again, despite progress, is that essentially every patient with myeloma, not everyone, but most, are going to relapse at some time. And, you know, when they have their first relapse, we can handle that because we do have all of those choices that I showed you. You can sometimes retreat them with the same things. And if you look at this particular uh, bar graph, this is basically showing various treatments given to a patient in their first or second relapse. And you can see that the response rates are quite high. But if you take a myeloma patient, and they do tend to relapse and relapse and relapse, by the time you're refractory to three or four or five drugs, unfortunately your survival is shown here, and this is work by Dr. Usmani from uh, Carolina, is that your survival is about six months. And that's something that people who treat myeloma know. So we really have to come up with new strategies Maybe that list of new drugs is going to be something that helps. One other idea is people think if we get that initial treatment to last longer, 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 maybe this won't be the case. So now I want to turn to the ugly. All right. The clinical trial participation is abysmal in the United States. And pretty much everything I showed you, all of those advances have to do with patients and physicians and nurses and other staff who are willing to take the time to put people on clinical trials. 
And this is a study that was done about 10 years ago looking at clinical trial participation for cancer in the U.S. And you can see it is a terrible 3%. There are some ethnic groups that do a teeny bit better, but it is awful. And uh, why is that? And I think anybody here who's done clinical trial work knows that the burdens are huge. And this, was, um, uh, this comes in part from my feelings and also from a roundtable held by the American Society of Clinical Oncology. And what they were looking at is things that we all know, that sometimes you can't get on a trial, you can't get one. The regulations are burdensome, um, institutional, IRBs. You don't get staff paid for to run these trials in most cases. You've got to come up with it yourself. If you've ever consented a patient on a clinical trial, it's very time consuming. And uh, it's sometimes, particularly in private practices, they are not allowed to have that space to actually enroll patients. Reporting of adverse events, whether they're important or not, we all spend a lot of time doing that in clinical work. Contracting and budgeting, you know, we guys are not business people, so we don't know what to do and, you know, what's a fair uh, a budget. And then we're also asked to separate out procedures that are considered not standard of care versus those that are, and that's very hard to do sometimes. Now, the other depressing thing is that this is a, uh, a survey done by Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York, a prestigious cancer center, and they were trying to figure out why couldn't they get people on their clinical trials. So they interviewed about 1,500, or 1500 consumers and about 600 doctors. And of the consumers, when they talked to them, they said, only 35% of them would ever consider joining a clinical trial. It's sort of very depressing. Uh, uh, three quarters of them saw no, saw no difference between a clinic or a hospital that offered a clinical trial opportunity versus those who did not. And only 40% had a favorable view. Uh, and the things would be what you would expect, side effects. They didn't want to be a guinea pig. They didn't want to get a placebo. And they were worried about extra costs. But if you read those same consumers, what a clinical trial is, then 70% of them changed their minds and said, oh, I, I would do that. Um, also depressing, if you look at the doctors that were surveyed, um, more than half said that they would only consider a clinical trial late in the course of an illness, and actually more than a quarter said a clinical trial is only for that last resort patient. So what this says is that we have to do a better job educating patients, educating the public, and really educating our colleagues about why this stuff matters. Now, the other thing is that spending on clinical research in the U.S. is terrible. And so this is a data from the National Cancer Institute looking at funding for cooperative groups like we belong to. It was virtually flat for many years or going down. There was a little bit of a boost during the Obama administration, but we're very nervous, as you might imagine, in the next uh, administration what's going to happen. You may have heard of what's called the cancer moonshot led by uh, former Vice President Joe Biden. This is an executive order, however, under Obama. And so while there is a, a funding initially to get started, there is no guarantee that this program will continue because it is not, it is not congressionally uh, appointed funds. Now, if you look, if people think, well, research is too expensive, we don't have the bucks, we spent $2.9 trillion in 2013 on health care all, for all aspects of it but only 2% of that went to research. And so when you think about the value that clinical research can bring to our patients in terms of better treatments, more effective treatments, potentially less expensive treatments, this seems like money that would be well spent. Now, let's go to drug costs. Now, you are all aware that drug costs can, or medical costs continue to go up. You know, for the last five years under the Affordable Care Act, the rate of rise has been between 2 and 3% per year, which is not great, but better. But if you look at cancer drugs, the increase has been almost 10% per year for the last five years. So why is that? Well, I think that there are some things that we can point to. One of this is, and again, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, is that old drugs get bought up by companies and become their property. So Melphalan, that ancient drug, used to be 35 bucks a month in 1992. If you wanted to prescribe it now, it's about $420. Cyclophosphamide, an even more ancient drug, 25 bucks a month until really quite recently, now 650 a month. So, you know, that, that seems a little bit hard to swallow. And then if you look at patented drugs, lenalidomide, when it was released, 8,000 and uh, 8,000 a month in 2005, pretty pricey then, but it's now $14,000 a month. So what you know justifies that cost increase? Same problem with bortezomib, 6,000 a month in 2005, and now it's 14,000 per cycle. So this is really an issue for myeloma because here's a here's a list of various combinations we can give patients 
Look at the price tags for a month of therapy here on these in, in average. And then if you start talking about three and a half years of treatment, because our myeloma patients are living on average 10 years at this point, that's a lot of money. And so, you know, you have to sort of think, is there something that we can look at and maybe make some changes? Now, I don't mean to point fingers at all, but I wanted to look a little bit at a company, Celgene. Now, Celgene bought thalidomide. They did not invent that drug. They did synthesize those isomers, um, uh, uh, lenalidomide and, and pal uh, pomalidomide, but this is their whoops, this is their own stock report from a couple years ago. Their sales were 9.3 billion in 2015, and six billion of that was Revlimid. Now, a third of that money went to buyback stock. Uh, Two billion went for salaries and drug promotion. Some of it did go to subsidize uh, uh, research to look for further FDA approval. But if you look at what you would call sort of novel R&D expenditures, like new drugs, new stuff, it was 4% of this total. Um, so, you know, I, I think that the justification for drug price that, that it has to be, it's, it's due to R&D, it, it has to be, I think, questioned a little bit. Now, other things that have happened have also had an impact here. So these are two decisions um, that I'm sure that some of you are familiar with, Citizens United in 2010, and also McCutcheon versus FEC, both of these decisions have allowed a huge tidal wave of money to come into elections. And if you look at spending in drug companies since 2010 on congressional elections, it has doubled. So this is really a big deal. Medicare D restrictions that were put into place under the Bush administration did not allow us to negotiate prices for drugs. And that's a real problem. But even more recently, if you look at an attempt in California, this was called Proposition 61 on the ballot, where what they wanted to do in California was for drugs that they were buying for their own Medicaid patients, they wanted to get the right to negotiate those prices, just like the VA. And that bill went down 54 to 46 in the public, and I don't think it's a surprise that $109 million was spent by drug companies to defeat that, and they argued that if that bill passed, there would be drug scarcities, and that there would be uh, incre increased costs because they would have to recoup it some other way. But if you look at RVA here, look at the difference between Revlimid. So a month of Revlimid here is seven grand. Across the street down the hallway, it's 14. You know, so, so what's the difference here? And, and you know, can't we sort of think about this as a mechanism that really might have some, have some legs? And I think, you know, I'm just going to tell you, voting matters. And I think, you know, as citizens, we all have to make sure that our congressmen, as physicians as well, know that these kinds of issues are very important to us. So in closing, I want to tell you a little bit about our myeloma group here. Um, I've been fortunate in the past, actually it's 10 years, but uh, not, not two, but uh, that I've been here. It seems like, I don't know, how long? But uh, anyways, um, I've been very fortunate to have wonderful colleagues here to work on our own myeloma projects. I just want to tell you a little bit about a couple of them. Uh, this is Dr. Payman Hamadi, who is heading up an exciting clinical trial here. We're one of 15 sites where we're going to manufacture a vaccine taking a patient's own tumor cells and combining them with their dendritic cells and making this hybridoma. We're going to take that vaccine, and after they go through a stem cell transplant, we're going to actually vaccinate them with their own cells. And so what we're hoping then is that at that point post-transplant, when there's a low amount of cancer, that patients are going to actually mount an immune response against their own specific tumor cells without without knowing necessarily the pathways, and this is sort of the ultimate personalized medicine approach, and we're very excited about that. Um, Dr. Fotis Asimakopoulos up here, he is working in a novel, novel area where he, is, he has discovered that macrophages actually elaborate a glycoprotein called Versican, and this very interesting glycoprotein can both be immune-suppressing or immune-stimulating, depending on whether it is metabolized by stromal cells and chewed up into another byproduct called versakine. This mechanism looks like it may be universally uh, uh, operating in many types of cancer, so we're very excited about his work, which is just fantastic. Um, this is Shigeki Miyamoto. He's been working a number of years looking at myeloma resistance, and uh, together uh, with Dr. David Beebe, they have come up with a very novel way to study myeloma resistance. Their theory is, is that it very much matters if you're testing sensitivity to drugs, if the myeloma cells are tested apart or with their friends who are secreting various cytokines. And Dr. Dave Beebe here has fashioned a very exciting device. And so we have a, uh, uh, a grant looking at 
if we can take a patient's bone marrow, place it in this device, and interrogate a patient before they undergo treatment and see what they might respond to. Again, sort of the best ex vivo model we think that, that might be workable. This is Erin Costanzo. She is doing exciting work here where she is looking at a patient's uh, immune functioning in the context of their mental functioning. So she has been looking at myeloma patients and measuring depression and anxiety and actually looking, it looks like there may be a, an effect on the immune system, and we're in the process of analyzing long-term data to see whether this might be both something, an, an observation that we can make and uh, perhaps a chance for intervention. So in conclusion, I think, I hope I've shown you today that myeloma survival has improved dramatically in the past two decades. There are an increasing number of therapeutic choices for patients, but we still need improvements in those areas of high-risk disease and relapse disease. The cost of cancer drugs is a real concern here, and we all have to get uh, involved and do something about this. But, all, but I think if I want you to take home anything is this, is that clinical research, clinical trials matter. They are essential for us to evaluate the effectiveness of drugs, the worth of our interventions, and it really is very, very important that we continue to support this kind of intervention vigorously. So I want to just close by thanking uh, wonder, my wonderful colleagues, the, the BMT, the Hematology Division, our Hematology Research Group, and these very, very hardworking individuals in our OMA group, Lynn Voke, this is Caitlin Chambers, Tammy Bowen, Mitchell Howard, and Heather Niels, also Ingrid Swift and Erica Barnstable. And thank you very much. for my alternative facts there. She's been here since 2004, <laughs> Ms. Folk. Um, I'll ask you to call in the audience and then re okay. repeat the question. Dr. Mackey. I think, you know, I think the, 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 the stick that's sort of held over everybody's head is this sort of, you know, presumed squelching of innovation. And I guess my argument against that would be that, you know, companies, they, they do have altruistic motives, but, and they also have a profit line. And so it is in their best interest to continue to innovate. And it is a problem. You know, the NCI, for example, owns, or I shouldn't say own, has access to some cancer drugs. But particularly when you're in myeloma and you want to do combinations, the, the licensing and the negotiation between getting one company to provide and the other ends up being very complicated. And, you know, I think that's unfortunately the landscape in the near future. Yes. So, so, the, right. So the question, well, it's it's um, it's you know, it's never black and white. Although sometimes uh, the climate is to say that it is now, but um, no. So, so some of the some of the advantages that Europe Europe has over us in in cancer trials, which which I do know something about, they they will restrict access to new drugs, saying we don't know that they have any value yet. So if you want to get lenalidomide, you have to join this trial. Now. I actually am not particularly uncomfortable with that model. Some people here feel that is coercive and that that is not allowing people access to life-saving medicines. And that's been, again, the reason to not have trials structured like that. Um, you know, on the other hand, there are places where it is very difficult to get drugs. And sometimes uh, patients in Europe have complained, excuse me, about that as well. But um, I think particularly if you have a drug that you're going to establish as a pillar of of uh, initial care, I don't think it's a bad design to say, yes, to be part of this trial, you have to get it. To, be, to get the drug, you have to be part of this trial. My perception is that in terms of prospective trials being investigated, mm -hmm. it's easier and more attractive 
Well, like I said, so, the, so the, the incentive is there for patients to join. And, of course, you know, as having single-payer systems also may help a little bit there, too, as well. Um, so, you know, some of the things about making sure patients come in and what's paid for and things like that, those kinds of considerations are, are I think, are somewhat less. Yes. Well, what I, yeah, does, is, did I say that transplants are the most effective therapy? So what, what, what is going on, and we are actually part of this clinical trial, some people believe that if we continue to improve the drugs that we have, that we will get rid of transplants altogether. But, up, you know, even with that most recent study, it sure looks like transplants, as, as toxic as they are, continue to help patients. And so that's why they have not gone away. But you are absolutely right. You know, the, the, the most recent ECOG trial that we're looking at is actually trying to delay the need for a transplant, potentially get rid of it. But, you know, it still, it still looks like the research supports the use of this. Yes. Thank you. Well, you know, we there. So, what about the cells that are in there before you do in the bone marrow before you do transplant? Um, uh, you know, patients don't go at diagnosis straight to transplant, so they do get treated. There have been some clinical trials in the past actually trying to cleanse those cells, or um, you know, either positively or negatively sort out myeloma cells. And at least those studies did not show any difference in relapse rate. And actually, they showed some side effects, like lower time to white cell recovery, and, and in, in some cases, an increased risk of infection, like the cells weren't as robust. Yes? Hmm. Well, you know, you, uh, how often do, do patients present with heart failure with light chains? You know, certainly I would say, you know, for amyloidosis, if we're going to move into that just very quickly, it's probably underdiagnosed potentially, I mean, because we haven't had very good tools for this. Now, I don't know of any research that says per se that light chains are toxic to um, uh, myocardial tissue, and it may be because it, it's sort of more of a renal problem before maybe you would see anything, but I'm not a, a directly aware outside of, say, amyloidosis that that has an effect. Yes? 